Good news today. New day of wrenching, and uh, I've had a chance to run the car for a while. I got let it really get up to temperature, and uh, two things: the valve cover, uh, the, the valve covers we took off yesterday, and resealed with gasket maker, uh, sealed up real nice. I don't see any leaks or anything like that coming out of it, so that's a win. Uh, we got rid of all that old junky cardboard that was out there, and I got new plug wires put on. I can't put on the, uh, there was a cover there that, you know, said Buick and, and it won't fit on there with this, uh, style of plug wires that I have on there. But, uh, more importantly, the car seemed to be running the same. So, and these were wires that I terminated myself. So they uh, was hoping that they would work well. And I think they've done just fine. So now we're waiting for torque tube parts to get here, so I have to find some other projects to work on in the meantime. So maybe we'll work on the uh, wiper motor and uh, wiper bottle and something else just to pass the time for a little bit. So I believe the way this works here is you uh, would develop a little bit of vacuum here in the top of this ball. Uh, that is going to pull a charge or a certain amount of fluid up into this reservoir and then when you release the button somewhere in the interior it's a push button in the middle of a dial uh, it automatically releases a charge of water and then it stops on its own and I was trying to figure out how it how it's doing that maybe it's just a certain amount because uh, I don't believe that there's a pumping action anywhere that you can access to do a continuous stream not like an electric motor where we have today I'm, I'm just going to assume you develop a one a one-time vacuum charge load up a diaphragm in here with a little bit of fluid that's been sucked up into it and then release that um, and maybe the diaphragm pressure uh, does the squirting for you I could be completely wrong about that but I do know that I'm at least holding vacuum uh, on this diaphragm that exists in here, so it's worth maybe continuing to play around with this little contraption a little more anyway. I've already uh, confirmed that there is suction that you can do from here, and it just pulls fluid out from the bottom, and there's a screen there uh, in the bottom, a fine mesh screen. Okay, let's keep playing around with this thing. Well darn, it looks like this ball jar that I bought that had the approximate size lid is a commemorative jar and is not even a screw type lid. It only has this just kind of like compression lid for like a more of a cookie jar. And uh, that is not what we need because if you put water in it and shake it around, it will eventually run around the sides. So, <sighs> failure. We'll have to try to find another uh, screw top lid uh, to fit the thing. Okay, let's instead work on wipers. So uh, it looks to me like there's just two main bolts, one here and one here that kind of hold this on. I've already disconnected this little bitty control cable that pops off. There's a little slide, probably a vacuum, no vacuum type actuator here. And uh, I've got the cable disconnected here. Let's uh, get that little unit off there and let's take a better look at it. And here's the unit out. You can hear the little vacuum coming in and out of this tube right here. It's been kind of painted over badly here, so I'm not exactly sure what it says on it or how I'm going to get this apart, but uh, we'll do a little bit more discovery on it here. So this cheeky little devil has these little rivet guys like all over it. It has no screws. It is a riveted sealed unit, almost like it's made to be used once and forever or thrown away and discarded if it don't work. Hold on, I'm trying to read something off of there. Huh. Maybe it does actually say something. Well, I'll clean up on this a little more, but uh, out on the internet there, I mean, they're just telling me there's a big leather paddle in there, and it doesn't seal well after a while. It gets dried out, and so you can try putting a little bit of fluid in the top, but I found out that if you actually take the unit off here, you can put uh, fluid down through those little... Uh, that's a filter there. That's a direct access to uh, the interior of the pump. 
and uh, I also put some tunnel oil down here and I can actually actuate it. And it, it sounds to me like it's actually, you know, sealing a little bit better. It's definitely moving some vacuum, um, maybe a little bit better than it was before. So this is about as cheap and easy an attempt at a fix as what you can do. It's two cents worth of repair and it's easy bolt on, bolt off. So let's, uh, you know, I've, I've worked it up pretty good here for a little while here, just soaking and soaking and soaking it with uh, oil. I'll uh, dry it off, clean it up a little bit. We'll reinstall it and see if there's any difference in the mo wiper motor. So we have wiper motor installed. Let's start up the car. She's still a little warmed up from before. All right. And activating wipers. Well, that's about as pathetic as what we had before, unfortunately. think increasing the motor speed is really going to create that much more vacuum since it's off of that pump anyway. I don't think it's a matter of having more or less pull on this little uh, guy right here. It just seems to kind of run out of vacuum. Just a little more to get over the hump. Okay. Well, interesting, but not exactly illuminating. So, back to the drawing board. All right, it's a new day with new enthusiasm to attack some things here. So, uh, I've regrouped. Let's look at that wiper motor right there, the one that wasn't working. So I found out that those little rivet guys, I thought they were rivets, they're not rivets, they actually are screws, little bitty weird oval head shaped screws only used on these little trico motors. If you scrub them hard, you can fashion a screwdriver that'll get over those heads and supposedly they will unscrew. So uh, by golly, I'm gonna take another crack at that thing sometime here in a little bit. And I'll take a measurement on that jar, and I'm still going to be on the hunt for a different jar. So we'll come back to that later. Uh, I figured today might be a good day to tackle the last of the, the running engine components here. Um, when you go through your manual, you know, you make sure that your fuel is right. You make sure your ignition timing is right. You make sure your points and condenser and coil and everything is doing well. And then you do everything else. And the last thing on earth you ever touch is the carburetor because nothing else is going to be, you know, going to work right. Or you don't want to try to compensate for other failures through your carburetor. So I spent a lot of time reading the manual and getting more familiar with it. And I did learn quite a few more things about the carburetor here, specifically the Stromberg one. So let's start on the other side here. This is part, this is a choke thermostat. That's exactly what this unit is all about. You can see there's uh, the top choke uh, valve right there. This pipe is, it does contain vacuum uh, because it's off of the manifold, but its purpose is not necessarily to create vacuum as it is to transmit heat to this thermostat here. That says rich right there on the uh, setting. Um, and you can make adjustments on this carburetor um, if you want to away from stock to uh, have it run a little richer or leaner at, at uh, initial startup. So I wanted to make sure that this one was set at stock and it's, it is. I don't know if it's going to show up very well, but there is a, uh, it's, oh boy, it's an arrow, believe it or not. What you're looking at at the top, there's a uppity arrow, little pointy arrow. If I go in slow, maybe I can make it stand out better. But anyway, that's an arrow embossed on there. It should be pointing straight up. It should match that, what they call a boss mark, which is this little 
piddly little mark, um, sorry. <laughs> a little mark right up here. That is a stock setting, so this has not been adjusted. And the uh, heat pipe, we've got that fixed. Uh, it needed to be fixed anyway because uh, it, you can't have a manifold leak. It messes with the way the car runs, so it's all got to be sealed up. So let's stop here and move to the other side of the carburetor. Alright, so these Stromberg carburetors are, um, really, they're kind of like dual carburetors. There's two, uh, everything is duplicated down there. I'm going to see if we can peek in there. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get enough light on there, but way down there in the bottom is two more sets of butterflies. You can see uh, two separate air horns right there, and uh, it absolutely is uh, duplicated two carburetor, uh, well, almost like a twin carburetor uh, setup. Uh, two primary, two uh, idling screws. You can see the two screws. Um, uh, here on the front, there's two of them. That's what you wind up adjusting, uh, and uh, it's a it's a pretty interesting little little carburetor. Um, most of the important parts that you um, are that you can't see in there do the the cool functions, which is providing you know idle up to a certain point. Then you've got a, a third set or second setting, which is just more when you're getting. Uh, better vacuum through the air horn and then there's even a third you know like above 70 mile an hour jet for just pumping raw fuel through this guy here is a uh, pumper so that when you do um, put your foot down on the gas it provides one specific little extra charge of uh, gas to make it just helps them run better and then uh, I'll show you uh, well, I think I already showed. Here's your two. These are your, these are your two idle adjustments right there. That's it. That's that's what you get. And then I'll show you the. Uh, there's a set screw right here for throttle. And uh, I'm gonna change the lighting here, and we'll start up the video in a moment. I keep playing with my carburetor, and I'm shooting extra fuel <laughs> around in here. So pardon the leakage. Um. Anyway, so right here, this guy. That, that screw that I'm touching right there is your uh, throttle, um, I guess your RPM adjustment screw. And it sits on a cam here. Well, let me get reoriented. So here's a cam. It's linked by this rod here to the choke at the top. So right now um, with the you know, choke pretty much wide um, open. We're not choking. We're not doing any extra choke. Where that screw sits on that cam, that would be considered the hot engine, hot idle cam setting. So once the car is warmed up, if you were wanting to change your RPM, you would be backing this screw here uh, in and out to get the RPM that you want. Then I don't know if I can do this one-handed very well or not. Um, there is also, because I'd have to take the pressure off of the screw there, but... Okay. Yeah, so, boy, I got that. I got two springs on there right now. That really makes it hard to do this, but... Uh, okay, there we go. I've got it freed. There you can see this cam has other uh, steps on its face. And that would be like a absolutely cold. Lost it again. Sorry. That would be the cold. You know, first start. Maybe a little bit more warmed up right there, depending on what your um, thermostat setting feels it should be. And then lastly, down a little further. And that last step is your hot uh, running engine idle setting. So the manual is very specific on where you should put your uh, needles, uh, your your idle adjustment needles. Uh, it also has very specific setting on where you should start with with your throttle uh, set screw. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start up the car and get it up to temperature and make a few marks so that I know kind of what stock is or what I should say stock meaning what we have right now because the car is starting 
and it will eventually, you know, stay running idle and, and, and get hot, and then we can maybe play around with a few RPM settings. And I'll mark those idle jets in the front so I know where we started from and do the, uh, the manual adjustments, which are basically you uh, gently screw in the needles, back them out simultaneously a uh, couple of turns, uh, lean it, and then, you know, both of them at the same time, kind of keeping track of where you are until it starts to run poorly. Uh, back them out further, richen it until it starts to run poorly. And if you know where the lean running poorly mark was and the rich running poorly mark was, you do exactly half of that on your uh, needle setting on how far you screwed out, and that should be considered the uh, optimal carburation setting. And then you have to keep playing with your RPM a little bit too in case uh, things start running a little better and your RPM start creeping up. So I'll have to put my tachometer on here as well just to kind of figure out where we're at. So, And I think the choke, for the most part, has been working. I haven't really watched it as closely, but I will this time now that I know kind of what I'm looking at. I want to see if it actually does what it's supposed to, uh, where it will go ahead and... Uh, actually stop the throttle on that uh, on that first face of that cam uh, and if it can actually like uh, over time warm up and then and bring itself back down so let's get it uh, this car started up oh and I also forgot to say that there are uh, the manual also has some specific um, linkage adjustment uh, settings as well between the gas pedal and uh, you know the the linkage up here so I will be um, adjusting those as well there's a dash pot might as well go ahead and show it there it is nothing more than a glorified uh, rubber bumper stop so that when you um, you know if you were to just zap your foot off the gas pedal and uh, the throttle is to come crashing back down. You don't um, kill or stall the motor or roll it by su shutting off vacuum so violently to it. Uh, oh gosh, bad camera work. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that <clears throat> that is supposed to uh, contact a little bit early and gently bring uh, the valves uh, closed so that we don't have a uh, you know stalling your car type of a symptom going on. So anyway. Um, they, I think they, though, they even recommend having all those done after the car is uh, making those adjustments after the car is warmed up a little bit. So anyway, let's uh, get going on it. Well, I'm not sure exactly what we would call this here because the manual says make sure that the pedal is uh, securely connected to the push rod and to the floor pan. Floor pan connection. This thing just comes all the way up. Got a lot of shadow going on, you won't be able to see it, but that's all the connection that I have here. So if there ever was a floor pan connection, no clue where it would have gone to. And it's been recarpeted over. So, I mean, it's not, uh, I don't think this is really a deal breaker. I mean, let's face it, that ain't much more to this here than just a uh, ginormous hole through the uh, firewall there. But anyway, I don't know. There's a lot of slop and play up and down in that hole there, but generally I think it gets the job done. So that's what that is. All right, we're starting to come up to temperature a little bit better. Um, yeah, running mediocre. I noticed that there's a really good size exhaust leak right about there. When I was zapping the engine, pretty good little bit of black smoke come, come out of there, and that's a lot of what I was smelling when we originally were driving around. So uh, that may be something I'll want to take a look at if we're actually going to be driving this car very much. I really don't want to get too much extra carbon monoxide in me if I can avoid it. <laughs> uh, anyway. So I'm going to continue to let the car, it needs to come up to uh, absolutely, total, completely full temperature before we start doing any type of uh, carburetor adjustment and hopefully I don't wind up creating uh, problems for myself where there weren't any. So 
so the next adjustment that they want to make sure you got is, uh, I don't know how well it's going to show. I'll try to touch it without burning myself against the hut. There's got to be clearance between this here and this bracket while it's running. So there's some play that you can do and the, there's a ball joint uh, and an adjustment on this, uh, on this gas pedal linkage here. And you can see that depending on how good it's going here, you know, if that, if that was going, um, if it, there was no clearance and it was resting on the bracket, you, would, uh, you wouldn't really have a, a good close on your throttle. Now the engine's good and warm now, so what I'm going to do is move on to uh, testing. I'll, put a, I'll shut it off, put a brick on the gas pedal and make sure that if we got full, full throttle opening going on. I'm sure we do, but I'm trying to do this by the book, so let's just go ahead and keep doing it by the book. So with the aid of uh, daughter's foot, I was able to have her put her foot on the gas pedal and confirm that, I don't know if it'll show, but there's a, that's where uh, that lever right here, that hits the throttle body, that's the end of travel. And uh, you're supposed to make sure that when you put your foot all the way to the floor, that uh, it stops just before there, rather than, uh, you know, putting undue strain on the uh, throttle linkage here. And I'd say probably right about there is when the pedal hits the floor mat. So <laughs> let's hope we're not having to do that too often. But all right, I'm done with uh, that part of the throttle linkage. Now I may actually wind up looking at this dash pot here uh, and checking out some of those settings to make sure that it uh, is uh, closing like it is supposed to. Well, now I'm not even going to do anything with the dash pot because unfortunately... Uh, the way that you have to check it is you would put your transmission in direct drive with the brakes applied, snap the throttle, uh, release the accelerator pedal, and if the engine returns to idle too slowly, back out on the dash pot. Uh, I'm not really sure if I have the best hookup going on here with the, with the transmission right now, so I'm not really sure if we're going to have a good dash pot adjustment and uh, I was driving it around fine before and it seemed to be just fine in, including taking my foot off of the gas and just letting it uh, roll and uh, it never did die uh, so let's just say that that's close enough at least for right now if I really get bored later uh, and once I got other parts put together and this is running better maybe we'll start uh, obsessing over just the, how good the dash pod is adjusted. So the end user on the carburetor only gets two settings to play with. It's your, uh, I'm not doing a good job of showing it, so underneath here, that's there's two of them. There's the idle screws, and then there's the throttle set screw right here. And on the Stromberg carburetor, uh, one and a half turns out from fully seated is your initial setting, and the uh, on the on the throttle stop set screw, it's an, uh, you turn it until it's just seated, and then you do one full turn more than that. And that is supposed to give you your uh, factory setting. Now, I've already taken some pictures of exactly where the set screw on the throttle is, and I'm going to count. Uh, I'm going to screw in one of these uh, uh, idle screws just to kind of see where it is, if it's close to just like the initial factory stock setting or if they're wildly different from whatever was uh, started here. Because uh, I don't want to get do too many things at once. So let's just see kind of where we're at. So I just checked both of them and they were pretty much both right at one and a half turns out. So uh, it was running pretty much with the uh, stock or factory or initial carburetor adjustment setting, uh, at least on idle. So from there on, um, I'm gonna see what happens just by, uh, I'm gonna start it back up, make sure it'll still run. And then I'll work on seeing what kind of RPMs we can get uh, down to with our uh, throttle uh, set screw. So I'm going to let it warm up a little more, but uh, right now my RPM gauge, we're up to about nine, about a thousand RPM. Uh, I'm going to let it keep uh, running for a little bit. Sorry, I got off camera there. About a thousand RPM, you have to take that and multiply it by 10. Uh, I'll zap the throttle and just make sure our linkage is kind of loose and ready to go. And then I'll start uh, adjusting the throttle screw. All right, we're dropped down to about 650, 660, back and bouncing forth. 
not too bad. I'm going to let it idle a little bit longer here and then I'm going to see what else I can get away with on dropping down the idle speed. All right, we're down to about almost 600, 550, 580, 600. So I'll see what else I can get away with here if I can go down any lower before it really starts to run bad. Well, we've dropped down a little bit more. We occasionally dance down to maybe the 400. 80, 490, 500. Uh, this tack kind of bounces around quite a bit. Then again, we're only sampling very short, <laughs> very short uh, <laughs> glimpses of when we're firing. It's just kind of loping along here. So let's see how it does for a little bit longer if it ever settles down. There, it kind of drifts down a little bit. So. That's not too bad of an idle right there. We'll see. Uh, we'll go ahead and finish out the adjustments on it here to see if we can actually find the uh, the best spot between uh, you know too lean and too rich on the idle screws. But that's pretty good. That's pretty close. So I had moved them both to. Uh, if you can picture me turning it in until they were just those uh, cuts were just straight up and down on there. That's when it started to kind of roll a little bit unevenly, maybe starting to, to, to struggle a little bit. And I stopped and put it back to where we were. Let's see how, uh, how rich we can go before we start changing idle. And I'll go uh, out a little more. So, um, I guess it's no surprise that at almost the factory setting of about one and a half, one and a half turns out on the carburetor, and uh, just playing around with the uh, throttle stop screw, you can uh, you can get it pretty close to 450 uh, RPM. Now technically this is about, I should have dropped it down to about 350 when I was doing my uh, distributor setting, getting my timing set. So it could be off uh, a little bit. Um, I don't know, I might go ahead and uh, get the timing light out and see if we can uh, make it run at 350 RPM. and and get a distributor reading but uh man for a 70 year old car just kind of burgling along here like it's doing i don't think anybody can complain about that that's pretty good i got maybe one i i don't know i might have one uh, rocker in there that's a little more chatterier than the others i might let someone else take a take a listen to that and see how it's doing but uh, still, that's pretty darn good. That's pretty darn good. In fact, uh, playing with this throttle stop screw is not quite even 100% accurate because there's a fair amount of slop. I mean, it's not, it's pretty tight here in the linkage, but I mean, you know, depending on how your foot drops and, and some other things, you know, it can change it. There, that kind of, uh, when you just kind of shook it out, it drops down to the 380, 400 there. So there's a little bit of slop and play in the throttle there, uh, linkage. Uh, so that's not even a true throttle stop carburetor setting. So there we are, 320. Yeah, so anyway, um, I might actually uh, tighten up that throttle stop screw a little bit there. Maybe I'll get the timing light and play out with the distributor. I don't know. I'm probably being a little bit too uh, OCD about it. We'll see. All right, I couldn't help it. I had to get the timing light out. I had it down to about 350, and we got our timing on. We're done. We're done. It's it's running great for being that slow of an idle anyway. I'm going to go ahead and step up my throttle screw just a little bit here so it runs a little bit more even, and uh, we're timed. We're done. That's it. All right, so I've got all the timing equipment back off of it. We're running... Well, it kind of goes all over the place a little bit here. I don't know roughly how accurate my meter is there. It's it's only able to... Bad camera. I keep looking at my own meter. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, 450, 430, 420, 480. That's in the ballpark. Baka, 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 baka. No, you can't complain about that. I think I need to just... We just need to stop. <laughs> Like I said, there's enough slop in the throttle linkage here that you think you've got your, your throttle screw set and you can shake it and maybe uh, almost kill it there. So I probably need to go ahead and uh, give it a little bit more throttle just in case I'm out on the open road there. Let's go ahead and 
I don't mind you running at that low for a little bit there, but it, that can't be forever, so. Yeah, a little more. Boy, there's a lot of a uh, there's a lot of slop in this linkage as you can see I've almost made it one full turn around here and I don't even think I'm really getting that much more improvement I got the wrong size screwdriver here hold on everybody I've been playing around here with this dash pot here which uh, which seems to have quite a bit of influence on my overall throttle linkage here I noticed like I had gotten on the gas pretty good there check it out And it's squeezing back, but it's doing it really slow. So I'm gonna, I may back off on that. Uh, now if I squeeze this down a little bit, see that? There's quite a bit of play really in that dash pot there, and it's messing up my throttle. I don't really like that. Of course, it's about a thousand years old too, so I don't know what am I expecting out of it here, but I'll play around with this a little bit more and see if we can get that to work a little better. I don't know if it's a lubrication thing or, or what it is, so let's play around with it a bit. I might also add, I really can't believe my uh, luck on here. I was ready to, uh, well what I was doing was I was reaching there, I was going to shut it off, and I accidentally hit my wiper button here. and. Uh, all of a sudden my wipers started working pretty good there. Now well, they were working, darn. What happened? Come on. Maybe because those uh, leathers finally started to soak up some of that oil a little bit better. That's not exactly fabulous, but uh, they're trying. I thought that was kind of interesting though. Notice the car kind of pulls forward a little bit on the gas. I might have to play with the detent on the transmission too. Boy, I tell you what, that dash spot there, it is slow to come back down. If at all, I better, I better get some lubrication and start playing around with that. Hello, wipers. <laughs> Almost. All right, I played around enough with that. I think I'll put the air horn on and see if it'll be able to run with a little bit more uh, draft and resistance on it. I may have to push that throttle screw in a little bit more while it's uh, while it's on the air horn. In fact, I think I'll go ahead and do that, and let's just see how it does. All right, air horn on. We're in the 450 to 500, but it, it bounces all over. I'll never really know exactly what it is. I'm pleased with that idle. That's pretty good, at least for a while it's warm. Uh, unfortunately, tomorrow when it's cold, I really don't know how good the choke setup is on this uh, and how, how well it's gonna perform on a cold engine. I've noticed like today when I first started it up cold, it immediately jumped down to the, uh, um, hot idle setting so we'll we'll see how it does uh, there may be some more work to be done here with that choke uh, set up on the carburetor but that's uh, super good I love the way that sounds I love the way it's rolling along we're not hiccuping we're not bumping not galloping or rolling you can put your foot on the gas and kind of you know ease it up a little bit soft
pretty slow to uh, return back down. I may have to play with that dash spot some more, and that's kind of irritating me now that it's uh, stopping travel. So anyway, let's work on that a little bit. So I won't take credit for it, but a uh, guy on the internet said, oh, if you take an old screwdriver that you hate or one of them cheapos, and I have a ton of those from just putting away furniture when, or building furniture, they give them to you now when you buy a furniture kit. Grind off the end, drive a, grind a slot in it, and then you can get on these uh, goofy little oval-shaped trico screws, and they are screws. I mean, I've already got one of them started there. It's not going to show up very well, but it is a screw. You can take them in and out. So... I'll uh, get to taking this guy apart here now, as soon as I clean off my bench. I can't really concentrate with this much clutter around it. Alright, that's better. Let's start by taking off these front screws here on the front of it and see what shows up. Okay, so here's a little tick-tock mechanism for going back and forth. Spring-loaded. And I'm sure that if I didn't, uh, just take that top off, it'll, something will shoot off that I don't want to. So I'm going to undo that spring tension and uh, take this apart real quick. And then maybe I'll take the top off of it. Well, it completely disintegrated, but there was a little keeper to keep that spring from ever sliding off left or right. Um, it was really rusted. It just disintegrated immediately. But I don't think that's going to be a problem. I'll just be able to put a little loop of a fairly stiff wire uh, and make a little uh, keeper so that spring can't uh, come flying off. And we'll just put that right back where it was. And uh, move on to the next part. Mm. I took off all these top screws here, and I'm going to see if this whole top part, including this uh, and that, will come off as an assembly rather than doing the other screws that are on here unnecessarily. Missed two screws. One, two. Just saw them. Okay, so what we have is a uh, very thin paper element here. It's not leather, it's some type of a cloth. It uh, has failed here and here, perhaps up here as well. So uh, that will need to be cut and redone. And then I'll have to look down in here and see what else needs to be done with this guy. I'm not sure. I feel like there might be something right here on the edge that has worn away. Because that does have to probably um, move pretty well inside here and uh, form a seal. So let's just kind of uh, keep going with this disassembly. So this is about the thinnest gasket material I'll have. I'll just spray paint over the top of this old gasket and hopefully it'll outline that little guy pretty good. The other gasket is in far worse shape. I wasn't able to get a perfect uh, match on it there. So I'll have to embellish a little bit of parts. Um, but uh, it's pretty close. I'll just, I'll just cut it a little sloppy to give me some trim room. Well, to wrap everything up, I have cast you down as faulty wiper motor. Despite my uh, best efforts today, uh, I've had some interesting little breakdowns, including this handy little doodad right here just absolutely disintegrating on me because it was completely rusted through. Uh, me trying to fabricate a replica of that and then losing patience with that. And no, I'm just... I'm just over, I'm just over you little Trico wiper motor. I will probably buy a uh, rebuilt one from a place that actually has the templates that you need for the gaskets and a few cutouts for some extra parts when they break. Or maybe I'll go to an electric down the road, I'm not exactly sure, but uh, unfortunately I think wiper motor is a bust, is a failure. So, we will update the next video when we come up with the plan B or plan C for wiper motor. But I'm still excited after today's wrenching just because the car seemed to be running so well. Uh, far more important than a uh, crummy little stupid wiper motor. Anyway, more to come.